Well, hello everybody. For the past few weeks, I've been building this chicken coop, and I've had several people ask me if I would uh, put a video together as I do it and, and post the video. So that's what this is. I don't hesitate to say that this is not a how-to video. This is a how I did it video. I openly admit I am not a carpenter. Um, I still think it's a reasonable job. It's uh, sturdy, strong, and doesn't leak. It's rained several times, all that sort of thing. And the chickens are inside. Uh, so if you don't have any interest in watching this great long video on how I made the coop, uh, in the description below the video there is a uh, timestamp, blue numbers, uh, and if you click on that timestamp, it will take you through to the end of the video, close to the end of the video, where I show the chickens, uh, both show them hatching and show them inside here in the, in the brooder. The coop, for all intents and purposes, is finished. Um, later on this summer, I will build uh, some uh, nesting boxes. No need for those yet. And I'll put in some roosts for the chickens to, to roost on when they're a little bigger. Uh, you see a lot of coops where people put their nesting boxes on the outside and all you have to do is lift up a, a door and, and you can gather eggs without going inside the, the coop. Uh, I just wouldn't do that here. Too many predators. It's just another place where a dog, a coyote, or a raccoon, especially the miserable raccoon that has hands, if you forgot to lock that, that's another access point. So I put my nesting boxes inside. That's why you won't see anything on the, on the outside of the coop. Anyway, it's, plus I guess this is the longest video I've ever posted. So like I say, if you're not interested in watching coop construction, click on the timestamp in the description below, and that'll take you through so that you can see the baby chickens. Thank While you. the girls are free-ranging, I'm doing what I do best, demolition. <laughs> that was a Lexan greenhouse, which I used for oh, 20 or 25 years, but it's been damaged quite a bit in the last number of years from winter storms and whatever. So I've taken the Lexan panels off. Some of them had to be discarded, but I got a nice pile of it. I ran out of battery. This is a couple of days later. Um, as I said, I've salvaged a pile of the Lexan panels and the better of those I plan to use um, when I make some cold frames later in the in the summer for, for use this fall. They're not all usable. Some of them are quite yellow, but I'll pick out the better of the ones. And, <laughs> and here we have a bit of a, a disagreement going on. These shoddy glares do not like the little uh, uh, mottled cochins for some reason or other. They don't hurt them, but... Uh, Model coachings are clearly at the bottom of the food chain here. I'm continuing my work on tearing down the uh, old greenhouse. I'm going to put a, a new coop back on the same foundation. Give you a little look at what I'm up to here. I think by the sounds of things, somebody just laid an egg. The old greenhouse, I don't know, it's 20 years old, maybe 25 years old. And I think it was a lot easier to construct than it is being to take it back down. Uh, I'm having a great deal of difficulty with the rusty nuts and bolts and whatever, but uh, the frame just isn't usable. The lower frame possibly could have been used, but it would have been, I don't know, some kind of a mess by the time I finish, so I'm going to take it down and put a completely wooden structure on top of it. But right now I'm busy trying to get it the side walls and the top of it out of there. Uh, there is a metal base around the exterior of it that I will, I will use because it's already square and it's just the exact size that I want the coop to be, um, six feet wide and eight feet long. So that part will come in handy if I ever get the top of it removed. Well, another day and a little more progress has been made. The uh, building materials were delivered this morning Hopefully enough. I usually run short. I miscalculate somewhere along the line, but I think that's basically everything that I will need. Some of the hardware and uh, nails and screws and things I've taken in the house in case it rains, but materials alone, uh, close to $500. I had a couple of other things in the order that uh, 
weren't part of this. So, I don't know, between 450 and 500 dollars, I guess, for the materials to build with. And now I'll take you down back and show you that I have finally managed to get the old greenhouse down. It's all bent up and I hope small enough pieces and out at the roadside for the garbage removal people on Thursday. The old greenhouse had a uh, patio tile, cement patio tile um, floor. I haven't measured them. They're probably a foot and a half square or something like that, I guess. Maybe they're two feet square. Anyway, yeah, I guess they'd be about two feet square looking at the dimensions of the thing here. It had this channel of, of metal going around that is uh, bolted with cement bolts to, to the patio tiles on the edge. And I first tried taking the bolts out of that and thought that would at least get the whole greenhouse off the frame. And no way, they will not move. They've been in there for 25 or 30 years and they're not coming out. I'm glad I didn't because then I, as I was demolishing it and taking it down, I realized that I can use that to good effect, I hope. Um, it's down there in perfectly square, as in 90, it's rectangular, but square as in 90 degrees at the corners. So that will enable me to put the uh, uh, two by fours that are going to go around the, the border uh, inside of that, and I won't have to do any squaring up. It's already square. And it's relatively level, as level as anything that I build, I guess. You see some of the channels uh, between the patio tiles, they were just filled with sand and things grow up in them. But they also, of course, go out under that metal edge. And I'm a little concerned that weasels might find that and dig their way in. So I think what I will do is scoop out some of the sand each place by the metal edging and uh, mix up some concrete and pour in there. Once they hit the concrete, I think they'd stop digging. Anyway, there is that, and uh, that's probably, this is today's work. I guess maybe tomorrow I will uh, get started on building it, although the snow and ice has melted, and I want to clean out the chicken coop and uh, put it out in the garden where I want to move it to, so that may happen tomorrow too, but I have lots of time. I'm counting my chickens before they hatch here. The eggs haven't even arrived that I'm going to be hatching in my incubator. So glad to have this part of it over with anyway. Well, I went to the hardware store this morning and bought a sack, a 60-pound sack of what they call sackcrete. Uh, it's a concrete mix all ready to add water. Um, it has sand and gravel and the cement, and then you just add water to get it going. And then I removed uh, some of the sand from these places where the... Oh, there are ten of them. Not some of them removed the sand from the, all ten of these areas where the uh, sand would have gone out under this metal channel that I plan to lay the sills on. Uh, just because I'm concerned about a predator getting in, the worst one around here is the one of the worst ones is the weasel. Also, moose or rat or whatever could dig its way in. I'm hoping if they find solid concrete, that's going to stop them. It isn't, hasn't been done to lock the blocks together or anything. They're stable enough, and it doesn't really make much difference because the whole area will be covered with shavings and manure once I get hens in there. But the sand that I removed, I have a use for it too. I've been wondering where I was going to get some good clean sand. There are lots of sandy beaches around here, but the sand would be salt. And uh, I plan to have a wildflower garden. I've been collecting wildflower seeds all winter, and uh, to that I've added some little bits and pieces of seeds from other flowers that I've had left over over the years. Anyway, to, to evenly distribute it, you mix all the seeds with a lot of dry sand, and that way you can uh, scatter the sand over the area once you've got it prepared. And so Now I have sand for that purpose. Well, this afternoon I hope to uh, get started with the wooden part of this coop. Well, I'm kind of insulted. The hens got bored with me and went home. <laughs> so I closed them inside. Anyway, I'm also a bit uh, feeling a bit silly here, me giving anybody carpenter lessons. It's, uh, trust me, I'm no carpenter. But I did have a couple of requests from people who knew I was building this coop if I would take them through what I'm doing step by step. So this is what I'm doing, not what you should do, I guess. I have put down a double layer of 2x4s, pressure treated 2x4s for the sill. Um, 
the new kind of pressure treated. I still wouldn't want to sit down and eat off of them or anything, but they're much more environmentally safe than they used to be with arsenic and heavy metals and whatever. They still have copper in them, but they have all kinds of little stickers over there where they've been approved by various environmental organizations. So I went to Well, that's one of the long sidewalls, um, studs, stud wall put together anyway, I guess. I'm using the pressure treated for the vertical studs and for the sill that goes along the bottom. And the closest end of it to you here is the top of it when it's stood up. And from there up, I'm, I'm just using regular economy 2x4s, not pressure treated because they're so much cheaper. But the rest of it, the lower end of the studs and the, the sill at the bottom, will come in contact with wood shavings and, and uh, you know, wet manure and all that sort of thing so they, they could rot. I'm not worried about the parts that's higher up, I guess. I made, of course, a mistake. Uh, this is Monday, it was Friday when I was working on this previously. and I thought to remeasure this morning and think it over again. And uh, I had cut the studs too long, which is better than cutting them too short. Too long, you can take it apart and shorten it up. Too short and you're really in trouble. But I'll show you when I put, it, uh, put the sheathing on. I'm about to do it, what I, what I have in mind. It's a four foot wall. Uh, four foot by eight foot pieces of plywood that I'm using for the sheathing anyway. But I want the actual wall to be a bit shorter than that so that the, um, there'll be a couple of inches of the uh, sheathing go down over the outside um, studs there, the outside sill, just to make it a little more draft proof and keep snow from blustering in, that sort of thing in the winter. Anyway, I'm just about to cover this up now. Uh, those are all done 16 inches on center, which is a standard measurement that works well with dimensional lumber. 8 foot uh, and 16 goes into it evenly, and 4 by 8 foot sheets of, uh, of plywood to sheath it in with, and 16 works well there as well. Also, if you were going to be putting, uh, say, paneling or sheetrock or something inside or insulating it, um, insulation rolls of fiber bat insulation are designed to go between 16 inch on center studs and I'll show you just now what I mean but on center not really necessary with the coop I'm doing it anyway just so I'll, I'll know where the studs are when I go to nail the sheathing on I don't won't be insulating it or sheathing the insides so it really wouldn't make any difference if I used it. You just see that mark on the bottom 2 by 4 where it makes up the sill. Every 16 inches along the length of it I, I put a mark like that and then you center your stud over that mark and that's what it means by 16 inches on center. Marvelous me telling you things about carpentry and I don't have a clue what I'm talking about but anyway that is what that means. I'm not sure if I mentioned or not but it's half inch uh, what they call CDX plywood, which means that's an exterior grade plywood that I'm using. There are cheaper products, some of this particle board stuff, but I've used it before and within two or three years times it turns into particles again, sawdust or whatever. So I prefer to put a little extra money into it. I don't intend to put any shingling or siding on the outside, but I will paint this and that will uh, make it quite, quite sturdy. I did my other coop, uh, what, it's been through two or three winters now, I guess three winters, and uh, it's only been painted once and it still looks good, so that's what I'm going to do again. Uh, I go the length of the piece of plywood once I have it uh, tacked down on the corners, make sure it's square, and I measure 16 inches all the way along, 16 inch marks, and then I use, I put in a, a top and bottom nail and use a 2x4 for a, a guide and draw a line down so that I know where to put the nails. Professional carpenter or better builder or somebody with better eyes than I've got wouldn't do that. But I find if I do that, I spend far less time pulling nails back out that uh, missed the 2x4 that's under there. So once I have a nice straight line to go, it goes on much quicker. A little word about the nails that I'm using, I guess. In the center is a three and a half inch galvanized nail, and that's what I use to frame up the stud wall with the 
bottom and top rails and the studs that are there, 16, 16 inches on center. To the left of that is a 4 inch galvanized nail and I'll use that to nail the uh, base of the stud wall to the sill. And on the far right is a 2.5 inch galvanized spiral nail and I'll use that to nail the uh, plywood onto the stud wall. And I like a spiral nail for that because uh, in different temperatures, heating and cooling and whatever, if, the, if it isn't a spiral nail, the nails will s start to pop out and you'll end up going around tapping them back in in years to come. But with a spiral nail, they, they're in there quite solid and uh, that doesn't happen, at least doesn't happen so much. So I prefer a spiral for that. And that is the nails that I'm using. Well, that's one wall standing. Um, I will uh, show you what I meant about the overhang on the plywood in just a second here. Though the wall isn't uh, standing square, it's just tacked up there. I'm with Well, it's got one brace tacked on one end of it there so the wind won't blow it over. I'll square it up when I put the other walls up and uh, attach them to it. But So far so good, one wall up and standing anyway. Hopefully I can explain what I'm doing here. This 2x4 here is the bottom of the wall that I just stood up. And this 2x4 here is the top sill of the two. I put two layers around to make the sill in the exterior. So I put the plywood on so that it comes down over this top sill. It doesn't do much for the stability of the wall or anything, but I can now go along it and put uh, spiral nails the whole way along and it will make it tighter. Uh, less draft, less chance of winter snow blustering in, all that kind of stuff. So that's what I was talking about. Well, there's the two longer side walls finished and standing up and being held up relatively straight by that uh, two by four that I've just nailed across the top bracing because of our windy weather here. It would, even though they're nailed up, they're large area exposed to the wind, just like a kite, they would be bent over in no time here. And next I've got to start building that uh, rear end wall, I guess. Well, I think this is about three days after the previous clip that you just watched. I ran short, or ran was going to run short, of 2x4s, so I had to order more of those. They were delivered today, but I really wouldn't have been working any sooner than this anyway. We've had three days of rain. And today it's, well, trying to clear off, I guess. Had a shower earlier this morning, but anyway, the coop now has three out of the four walls. And I was able to remove that cross bracing because with the third wall nailed in, it's uh, quite sturdy. The wind isn't going to bother it unless we have a hurricane. So now to move on and put a fourth wall in. Well, we now have four walls and the large opening in the front, of course, is where the door will be. And that cross piece, I'm going to leave that there until I have the rafters up and have the roof sheathed in. That just makes it more stable. And I'll show you one little thing that I did. Uh, well, it's common sense, but I'll show you what I did to uh, sheathing the, the two end walls. And that's a four foot uh, spirit level. I use that to get the walls level and plumb. Well, as level and plumb as anything ever is that I built, as close as possible to leather, level and plumb, I guess. I, my third project, this is my second coop, and I built my cabin a couple of years ago. And I, uh, I always tell myself, you know, it was a, it's a cabin in the woods, it's not the Taj Mahal. Well, the same with this, it's a chicken coop, it's not the Taj Mahal. But I try to get things as solid and as, as level as I can get them. Anyway. <laughs> We have competition from Prince Leah. This is a side wall, the long wall is the eight foot wall. And when you're sheathing it, you just cover it with the sheathing, the plywood. I, as I showed earlier, I leave an inch and a half hangover at the bottom to nail onto the sill. But this is the front wall, and I did the same with the end wall at the back. Uh, you measure it so that you've left an extra four inches, and that covers uh, these two by fours. I say four inches because the the plywood is uh, half inch and two by fours are not 
two by four. They're actually one and a half by three and a half. One of these little things that they do for some reason. And uh, I don't worry that it hasn't completely matched up here. I'll be putting uh, in boards on that will cover that up when I've finished. But that's enough out of me and Prince Leo. Inside the coop looking out this time, I just put a second row of two by fours, make a double sill, went all the way around the top. And that uh, serves to lock it together and to make it, you know, very sturdy and strong. Um, probably not at all necessary on a building this small, but another advantage is it gives me another inch and a half of hidden room in here when I put the rafters on. This is, the dimensions of this were taken off of the old greenhouse that used to be here, and I didn't have any trouble at all. The peak was high enough that I could walk around inside without hitting my head and I had benches down the long side walls so I didn't get that close to the, the uh, roof on the on the sides so I didn't bump my head in there then but there won't be any benches in this one so every little bit of head space I can get I'm going to use. I know I'm going to have to duck to come through the door. I'm quite sure the dimension of the door in height was five and a half feet or something like that but anyway time will tell i guess i think it'll all work out but there's a second layer of uh, two by fours making the top sill double the whole way around i'm just about to start cutting the rafters and there is a lot of complicated calculations which i do not understand however uh, there is a website which I think does a good job. Time will tell in a few minutes after I've counted the, after I have cut the, the rafters. You have to determine the pitch that you want on the roof, and mine is going to be fairly steep um, because I want to get enough headroom in the center there. Also, steep will help with the snow falling off it here in the wintertime and whatever, too. But anyway, uh, after fooling around with this uh, particular website, I went for a 30-degree angle. And the, the website does all of the calculations for you and produces drawings. And then you can print this template which gives you the uh, angle to cut at both ends of the rafter, the, the end that will be up at the peak, and then the reverse of that is the end that would be down uh, on, on the overhang of the roof. And then there is a thing called a bird's mouth rafter cut that you have to do. And if you cut this template out it, and lay it over the edge of what I'm using is two by four, uh, then it gives you the angles to cut to get the bird's mouth. The bird's mouth is here. This is where the uh, the rafter sits on the wall and you have to do a cut in here and then do what they call toenailing it, nailing it into the into the wall to, to stabilize it. Anyway, I really don't understand this well enough to give you an in-depth explanation, but I will put a link to this very helpful website down below the, uh, the video here. Well, it's far from perfect, but there is the first rafter up. I used the paper template to cut the first rafter and then use the first rafter that you cut as a template for the rest of them, so they should all be roughly the same. Well, there's the rafters in place, such as they are. Yeah, I think it's a fairly decent job. My birds move beaks or mouths or whatever are not perfect, but anyway, they're up there. I didn't use a uh, center board, and I forget what you call that, but anyway, uh, in larger construction, there is a plank or a board and the rafters fastened to each side of it. I've just put the rafters together with large wood screws, screwed them together. Um, the plans that came with my cabin, uh, that was how it was done. And this is a smaller structure than the cabin, so I'm sure it's... And my uh, chicken coop was done the same way. So the other chicken coop behind this one, that is. So. And I only put rafters over every second um, uh, stud in the walls. Um, again, that's how the other chicken coop was done. It stood up to three years without any problems. I think that's plenty strong enough for no bigger than this building is. Well, I think next I will frame in the door and close in the 
two end peaks with plywood before I start putting on sheathing on the roof. There's a doorway sort of framed, I guess. And I've either got to invest in some aspirins or remember to duck. It is not as tall as I thought it would be. Evidently, I didn't get my angle peak on the roof quite steep enough, but it will do. The easiest way I could think of of getting the roof angles right and the opening for the doorway was to cut a piece of plywood about an inch taller than I needed and tack it up there. And then on the other, other side, I scribed out the lines of the cuts that I need to make. I think that's going to work. I'll make the cuts and we'll come back and see. Well, I think that's enough for one day. I'll leave the roof. Start that tomorrow if we have another good day. It's been a beautiful day for a change here. Finally getting some spring weather. It's around 20 degrees today. So that's both ends closed in. And now to put the roof on. Well, it's always nice when something works out even if it was mostly <laughs> accidental. One 4x8 sheet of plywood just covers one side of the roof. And my original calculations for the building with the pitch that I thought I was going to get on the roof, I would have needed about a sheet and a half to cover the, the roof area. So consequently, I'm going to have a little plywood left over. That's okay. I've got some other projects I want to build this summer. The nest boxes for this, for one thing, but... Also, I'd like to build some cold frames. So That's one side covered, just barely tacked down. I've got to go to put all the nails in it now. Well, here's the view from behind the new coop. Uh, the roof is completely closed in, and I decided to put aluminum flashing over the uh, front and back where the roof and the wall join because there isn't any overhanging eaves. And in a high wind and rainstorm, that's a place where rain could get driven in under the roof and run down the walls inside and hopefully with the flashing on there that will stop that problem. It's not actually an expert installation as you can see it's kind of crinkly but that will once I've got the roof uh, covered shingled whatever or, uh, rolled roofing I'm going to use um, I will put on um, trim boards and that will cover the flashing it won't be visible once the once the coop is finished, now I'm ready to put uh, roofing felt, tarred paper on, and uh, after that, hopefully today, I'll get the uh, rolled roofing on too. The tarred paper went on relatively easy. I hope that the uh, rolled roofing is as easy. I'm going to watch a video or two, I think, on YouTube before I do it. It's easier to learn before you do it than have to take it back off and do something differently. So. And the hens and the rooster, they keep checking out the new new digs. I don't know if you can see him in the doorway or not. That's Leah, the Prince Leah, the rooster. It's probably not showing up. It's so dark in there. But they think it might be for them. The rolled roofing is on. Now I think I will box in under the eaves. I don't know the terms properly. I think that's called the soffit. Anyway, it has to be boxed in because there's a space there where not only insects but predators could get in. So I'll box in under the eaves and once I've done that and uh, built a door, it isn't finished but it's ready that it could be used. So I'm, I'm it'll be, I've got over two weeks yet I guess before I find out how many chickens hatch. So no problem, I should be ready. I'd like to get it painted before I put them in there so they don't have to suffer through the paint fumes. That's both eaves boxed in anyway. I guess that's it for today. I'll save the door until tomorrow. And if you've been wondering, there aren't any windows. There is a window in the door. The hens are getting excited. They hear me talking. They think I'm going to let them out again. Well, not right now. I'm going in for dinner. Um, I'm using a kind of window called a shed window or a playhouse window. Anyway, no framing required. And I'm going to put, you know, I'll show you more about it in the next clip when I'm making the door tomorrow, but I'm going to put one in the door. If I decide that isn't enough light, I can add others to the side wall. It's no problem at all that you just cut a hole out and put them in, basically. Well, one homemade door with window installed. 
I can, I can explain what I've done here or not. But this 2x4 stuff here is not just for molding or decoration or whatever. Uh, that is attached to the plywood. The door is on the half inch plywood, the same as the rest of the building. And uh, that's attached with 2 inch wood screws, which forces the plywood to become uh, rigid rather than warped, which it tends to do in a sheet of stuff like that. It will warp a bit. And as far as the window, uh, all you have to do for, to install one of these is cut a hole in the plywood, uh, in this case 18 inches wide and 23 inches deep. I put a bead of uh, silicone caulking around it and plunk it in the hole and then half inch wood screws is already pre-drilled holes all the way around. Uh, this opens for ventilation and has a screen on it. Uh, which is not safe enough for here. I have raccoons that would go through that in no time. So I will eventually, before I put the chickens in there, I'll be putting um, hardware cloth, quarter inch square hardware cloth over the outside of it again for more safety. I did the same thing on the, on the larger coop. And to hold it to, I have two uh, screen door latches. They, when you open it, they, they click open. When you close it, they go in and hold it too. Also, I used uh, spring-loaded screen door hinges so the door tends to close on its own or go close to being closed on its own. Eventually, I will put a hasp and a padlock on here. Uh, simply because I have a hasp and a padlock on the yard for the other coop, but the yard for this coop is going to be behind it, so if I want to lock it up, I've never had any problem. I shouldn't indicate that I've had a problem, but I know children visit when I'm not here, and they would tend to open a door, and some hens would go scooting out, so uh, when I go away for the day or whatever, I like to make sure it's, it's locked up. Anyway, there is that installed. I got a real good deal on uh, some solid color stain at the hardware store. Not a very fancy color, it's a dark gray, but I asked what uh, they had that would be the cheapest, and this was something that they had, I don't know how many years ago or months ago, it was mixed for a client, and the client didn't like the color, so it was sitting in the basement, and he let me have it for $12 for a gallon. It's usually close to $40 for a gallon. And I have a quart, I guess, of other color, I think red, that I can use for, for the trim. So next thing, I guess, before the chicks go in, I'd like to get it painted and get some of the trim boards on to cover up that flashing and whatever. But uh, if I had to, it's ready to use now, I guess. Tight and uh, going to find out if it leaks or not because it started to rain now. But anyway, next phase will be to paint new coop with the old coop in the background just finished putting the finish boards trim on. I don't have any trouble at all now understanding why the original person returned the color of that stain. <laughs> Has to have been a mistake in the mixing of it. Probably on video it's showing up as a dark gray. In the sunlight it's a cross between a chocolate brown, a gray, and a mauve, depending on how you look at it. Anyway, can't argue with the price. Twelve dollars for a gallon of it and that was plenty to do two complete coats on the coop and enough left over probably for a third coat. The trim also didn't cost me anything and it's very expensive paint. A good friend of mine uh, who used to live in Maine, in, in Rokes Bluff in Maine, moved a couple of years ago to uh, New Hampshire and uh, I was a lucky recipient of many of her gardening tools and ornaments and all these sorts of things, and a quart of very expensive paint. The paint was $18 a quart. Um, I forget the name of it, New England Red or something like that, but it's a traditional red color like you probably see on an old barn or whatever. Anyway, the two together makes for quite a dark and rather somber looking coop, but I don't think the hens will mind. I'll give you a little look at it from another angle here in a second, but the uh, next major clip in this video will be when the chickens are hatching in the incubator and then when they're moved into the coop. And that will finish this rather lengthy little saga here. Guess what I didn't say is this is May 24th, Saturday, May 24th, and the eggs are due to start hatching this coming Thursday on the 29th so I'm finished just in time. There are what looks like 14 viable eggs at this point, but uh, 
don't count your chickens until they hatch type thing, I guess. But whatever, they will be moving in there. I'm still not certain which family of hens will actually inhabit this come fall. The young ones will go in there while they're growing, that's for sure. But if I do actually get 14, that's too many for that small coop. So I'll leave my uh, current four Shanty Claire's in the other coop and put the new ones over in the big coop as well and move the other birds into this coop. Well, it's Tuesday the 26th, two days before hatching is supposed to take place and it's time to stop the eggs from turning. The, this incubator turns them automatically and uh, to increase the humidity inside to make it easier for them to hatch and to remove the uh, rails that hold the eggs in place. I thought I'd show you this uh, shot of it before I uh, get that a little better there, I guess. Before I uh, take it out of the cradle. When I say turning the eggs, there isn't anything inside that physically turns the eggs. The entire incubator sits in this cradle, which is mechanized, and it slowly rotates it. It's on its downward swing right now in this direction. It goes completely upright again and then down in the other direction. Just continually does that very slowly. I'm not sure. Probably takes it an hour or so to go through each cycle. But that's the equivalent of, of turning the eggs. It moves them enough. Um, I'll show you what it looks like when I get it taken apart here and ready to put the eggs back in it. Well, that's the bottom of the incubator, it's just a, the plastic bottom. It doesn't have the heater or anything in it. And those two channels that you can see are where you put water to increase the humidity. So far only one of the channels has had water in it. But now that they're in the last 48 hours of their hatching, you increase the humidity. So both of these channels gets filled with water. Also there's a vent on the top of the incubator which has been half open and now you close it down to uh, one-third now if I can get the eggs back without dropping them. And these rails that have been holding the eggs in place, they get removed. So the hatching chickens won't get their legs caught in them. And the top gets put back on the incubator if I can reach it from here. It's a matter of waiting for the next 48 hours to see what happens. This is the vent thing here, which is half open. And I'm closing it down to about a third to help increase the humidity in there. And the next clip, hopefully, will be as soon as some of them are picking their way out of the eggs. I'll try to get some footage of that. Well, this is Wednesday the 28th. About 30 hours after the last clip there where I stopped the cradle from turning the eggs. And if you can see here, that egg is starting to hatch. Earlier this morning I was quite certain that I heard peeps inside of some of the eggs. Right now I can see five, maybe six eggs that have holes like that in them. So hatching has started. Um, of course, they're not hatched out yet, but it's about 24 hours earlier than I thought it would be. I didn't think they would hatch until tomorrow, but I guess I'm ready for them. I might move the lighting there and make that any more evident or not. It's hard to shoot through the incubator and to get the light right, but it looks like we're going to have some chickens soon, anyway. I don't think I'm going to get a lot of sleep tonight. 
<laughs> it's now 11 p.m. Uh, five have hatched. Three are already out in the uh, coop in the brooder. And there are two here in the incubator. You can see one there moving a bit. And the other one's off in the background somewhere. Instructions say uh, not to open the incubator more than once every six hours. So it'll be another three hours or so before I open it again and take this one out and remove the uh, eggshells that they came out of. And there are two at least more eggs that I can see where there's a hole starting to come in them. They move the eggs around so much when they get wandering around in there that I I lose track of them, but uh, anyway. Right now there are five and at least two more that are coming out. 9.30 a.m. day two. <laughs> I did get a little bit of sleep last night. There are now uh, eight that have hatched. Six are out in the uh, brooder and these two most recent ones that are still in the in the incubator here. Uh, like I said, I'm only supposed to open the thing once every six hours. Well, one of those just barely hatched out when I took the other two out, so I did get a chance to remove the broken egg. And I see three more, four more eggs there that are clearly trying to hatch, which leaves two that uh, so far no activity. But anyway, you have to you can't count your chickens till they're actually out of the egg. Some try to hatch and still fail. But that is the update as of now. Anyway. Out of the 14 eggs, 12 hatched, so far anyway, it's now 8 p.m. on day two of hatching here. The other two eggs don't seem to be doing anything, not at this point anyway. I'll leave them overnight just in case they, they are trying to hatch. The red cord thing that you see hanging down there goes to the brutal lamp. Couldn't find a way of getting the camera down in there without that being in the view. Varying degrees of activity from them. The latest ones to hatch are still quite quiet. The ones that hatched earlier are very rambunctious. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much for watching, especially those of you who sat through this entire long video. But I hope you enjoyed the look at the coop and the coop's newest inhabitants here. <laughs>